these days in China. So I have two co-authors who are writing this paper. Uh, they are from Fudan and uh, Wuhan University. So uh, what is peer-to-peer -peer lending? So uh, this, this is a FinTech innovation. So previously, uh, you know, there are somebody who needs money to finance something, no matter you are buying a car, buying a home, or you want to start a business. And then uh, there are, you know, people who have you know, extra money want to lend out. So there's a, this demand and supply. And uh, this is the finance demand and finance supply. And it used to be the traditional bank who were doing this. And of course, the bank will screen uh, the, uh, uh, the, the people who request a finance and then try to match them with uh, the, the fund, the borrowers. Uh, so the lend, uh, match the uh, lender with the borrower. But now we have these, uh, when there is an infrastructure about, uh, you know, online payment and also the infrastructure about uh, kind of verifying information uh, on the, as a platform, uh, there's this uh, business that being grown. So the first P2P platform is, uh, is a, called Zopa, uh, starting in the UK 2005. And it quickly is followed in 2007 uh, by Prosper, Lending Club, and then there's the PPDI, which is uh, one from China. So uh, it, it has some advantage of providing small size loan, and then people have different, uh, you know, from the lender, they like to take different kind of risk. And from the borrower, they have different kind of need, they post the information. So, uh, you know, the platform in the middle is just an information intermediary. Uh, sometimes they verify information and then uh, provide this information to the, uh, to the lender. And then the lender just uh, decide who I finance who. So these days, if you go to prosper.com or lending club, you still see that many people are posting their loan request. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you, uh, you can decide who is uh, credible and trustworthy. And then you are willing to lend the money in this, uh, at a certain rate. Of course, you are uh, exposed to some default risk. So this is the P2P platform uh, business model. But what's happened in China is uh, the history is a little bit different. So here I give a very short name for the history. It's called the, uh, uh, the boom and the bust. So uh, you can see the number of platforms goes to a very high peak, over 3,000 in the uh, uh, year around 2005, 15 or 16. And then it uh, decreased, decreased, decreased. And the here actually in uh, November 2020, the central bank that's okay there was zero platform anymore so this this business go through about a seven a 13 year history starting 2017 and then a return to zero so uh this is a very drastic boom and bust and then you if you look at later i will show you the picture of the market size it was so huge compared to the developed world but uh, in the end this entire market better so uh in this paper we will review the history I will show you some what's happened in this short history of China's P2P platform market. And then we have some theoretical explanation for it. Uh, it's, and it's important to note that this market fell in China, but does not fail in the US and other developed countries. It's still a, you know, a, a good business model that's running. So what's the main difference that in US and other economy, uh, mostly developed economy, this business can sustain and grow? But in China, it experienced this boom and the bust, and then uh, return to zero. Uh, so the phenomenon, there is a one important event happened in China. This is, uh, you know, I listed here the phenomenon in China. So that's at a given at a given time that almost all the platform start to change their business model. Is they are not playing the role of information intermediary uh, anymore. Instead. They start to take up risk themselves and then offer product with this thing. We call it principal guarantees, principal guarantee terms, which means at least they claim, okay, it says that you give it the money, it's safe. Okay. I will, I will return the money to you 100%. And even sometimes they guarantee a return 5%, 10%. Okay. It's not like in Lending Club, Zopa, they say clearly that it's on your own risk. If you invest somebody, or some small firm that fail, then you lost your money. Okay, so here, the China the China's platform give, you know, under this uh, intense competition, they give us some, in some sense, it's an unrealistic promise. Okay, it says that you will surely get your money back. Okay, 
So why would they do so? Okay, why would they do so? Like, what is the? Is there some uh, reason they all offer this principal guarantee terms? And second is there is a, a large proportion of which have P2P product come with fraud. Fraud means that just like Ponzi scheme or running away with the money. So there is a portion of the, it's not all, okay? So you have 100 case, maybe 30 of them have this problem uh, that involve uh, legal issue. Uh, of course, the, one of the key feature of China is this market grows so fast in the period. So the number of platform is very large and we'll see why uh, it can be driven in force. Uh, we have an uh, analysis and then we'll talk about platforms incentive of whether it's going to offer this principal guarantee and whether it's going to come before. Uh, and then these actions would depend on the platform level competition and also the how you can see how smart is the uh, investor. We call it investor naivety, investor naivety. Okay. And then what is the policy implication regularly in this kind of market? All right. Okay, so let's uh, first review this a short history, who may bust. So the number of peer-to-peer uh, -peer platform, uh, you know, start to increase rapidly after 2012. So the first one is 2017, it's called PPDI. It's very successful, we go to New York Stock Exchange and then uh, uh, IPO, okay, very successful. And then uh, this market uh, starts to grow after that. There's nearly no regulation before 2015. There is an important reason for that. I show you this picture first. This is the interest rate, okay? So peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer finance is an important complement to the traditional banking sector. So especially for small size loan and some you know, household who need finance, you can see there were two dotted lines here. First is this benchmark interest rate. This is what's, what, you, uh, what is interest rate you, you borrow money from the traditional bank. But, you, uh, but usually, okay, as an individual or small, uh, you know, uh, a small size company, it's very hard to borrow money from traditional bank. So they will borrow money from other people, okay, other people. So this is the second line here, the red line, this is called the Wenzhou Index. Wenzhou Index is collected by the Wenzhou government to see if you just, I borrow money from don't know how much, you know, he, he's going to charge me on interest rate, okay? So this amount, purely amount people, okay? Of course, that's uh, much more risky, right? So he would, if I borrow money from him, he would demand a high, interest rate, usually uh, 20%, okay? So if you borrow from me to start a business, you have to, I borrow you 100, you have to give me 120 yeah, next year. Uh, and then this peer-to-peer -peer platform, this interest rate is right in the middle. What does it says? It says that number one, okay, there are some people who has demand so that, you know, they cannot get the loan from the bank and they would like to go with the P2P platform. Number two is it does provide some efficiency. So if we just borrow from the individual, more expensive. But if I borrow from the platform, cheaper, okay? So maybe the interest can go to 10%, okay? So instead of borrowing money to, from Donald, I can borrow money from the platform. That's uh, easy, right? So there's a demand and it helps what we call financial inclusion, very important. So many of developing countries, they care about this financial inclusion. Uh, they want people to have access to finance so that they can start their business, and then buy essential capital so that they can, you know, start to make a living. Uh, so by that time, the Chinese government think that this industry, okay, is just affecting small individuals, small business. We can let it grow. So before 2015, the first eight years, you can say starting 2017, there's nearly no regulation of this industry. So the pump, it's not like bank, it's been highly monitored, but the platforms, Usually it's registered as a technology company. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it's not under any, uh, you know, it's the, the uh, uh, central bank and the, the regulatory authority is not looking at these platforms. They let them grow to think that it's a complement to the traditional banking sector and expand, uh, you know, market inclusion. So by that time, there's no regulation being issued in this market. The first regulation that will show issue in 2016. And then because of that, uh, you know, there's a, you know, this is a relatively underdeveloped financial industry. So there's a series, a serious credit rationing problem. So people have demands. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, you know, the, there's also, on the other hand, you know, the lender also uh, wanted because in China, we typically have limited option for investment because the, there's a capital restriction. You cannot invest in foreign assets. 
So the P2B platform offer a good return. Okay, so then people will like do that. It's also by the time that there is a, a important development of financial technology of infrastructure or online transactions, so people can you know transmit the money to a platform and the platform get transmitted to other people, uh, you know, uh, like Alipay, okay, those kind of things. That's be also be an extension for that period of time. So we see this grow, okay. So every month, you know, even one hundred, even hundreds of platform started, you know, entering this in, enter into this business, okay. And you can see that also the number of lender grows, number of lender grows, but. At the beginning, even the number of borrowers is catching up, and then gradually start to about at the same size, and then you know it's about at this level that they start to drop just together with the number of pet. So, uh, this is the uh, transaction volume. Okay, so in two thousand seventeen, the total the thousands of a P two P platform handle approximately two point eight trillion uh, Chinese yuan transaction, and then so this is the. Uh, kind of the uh, monthly transaction volume. This is the cumulative amount. There's a cumulative amount. We call it unpaid loan. So what's inside this P2P sector? Uh, so if this industry bankrupt, then all these loans will be gone. Okay. So this is total unpaid loan. Uh, it's total about one trillion Chinese yuan. Uh, so it's still a small size. So compared to the total bank loan, so in China, it's a one hundred twenty. So it's a less than one percent. But these are most of these. This investor are individuals. So uh, still, when this uh, platform later starts to have the waves of collapse, it uh, has, has a lot of huge impact and a lot of people suffer from this uh, uh, you know, collapse of this uh, industry. So if you do this international comparison, it's very astounding, okay? At the peak, the total amount of P2P uh, lending platform was 10 times greater than the, what's in the US, the same sector, the same market, okay? So you can see here, in 2013, it's still comparable, but when you go to here, you can see that it's about 10 times, right? So uh, not to mention other countries. So this uh, market has grown to a size that's, you can say not matching our, you know, uh, not matching the foundation of our economy and how does it grow in this way, okay? Okay, so, uh, the, at the, you know, as we said at the beginning, the government have this a uh, free economic you know thought to so just let it grow, okay. And then many platforms start to register as a consulting firms or technology company with small register capital. They don't have much, you know, uh, capital themselves. After two thousand fifteen, the waves of platform class start to hurt investor confidence. So that you can see after two thousand fifteen, uh, following waves of uh, this collapse, platform. You know, uh, the, as investor base start to reduce, and then you also see platforms start to collapse. So the red line is the uh, number of platform collapse. The largest wave come in two thousand eighteen. So there are some, you know, uh, you know, important cases. Both of them have uh, unpaid loan for over one billion Chinese yuan. Okay, so these are the, the cases, and then uh, some of them is uh, very popular. Uh, maybe some of you heard of this uh, Fan Yai. Okay, case or this uh, Yizhu Bank case, okay, and then uh, you know these uh, this uh, this happens over years, and then there were this big influential uh, platform collapse cases affecting lots of lenders and lots of you know uh, you know lots of money, and also these starts almost all of them, all of them almost all of them, <laughs> okay, is it all? Almost. Yeah, some of them. Okay, some of them, not. but these are. Uh, I, I use I to verify that. So basically, there were uh, convicted financial fraud cases. So basically, uh, either the business model is not right, it's, it's a Ponzi scheme or fabricate information, or they uh, the owner just uh, run away with the money. Okay, so almost of them involve uh, uh, fraud, financial fraud. So uh, if you look at the reason for platform collapse. Uh, we say that what we, I categorize a normal reason and man-made reason. Normal reason as a just a liquidity problem. So it, it's it it has a, it's doing you know everything uh, you know legal, but uh, because of liquidity problem, lack of investment, failed to make profit, so that you know maybe the owner stop the business. But there are about uh, you get twenty six percent of the cases I call it a man-made risk. 
either this is called absconding by the owner. This word I also know just by uh, writing this paper. It's a uh, just means running away with the money. So you get the money and then you uh, make it you know oversee and then you also fly away. So this is absconding. So the owner is the owner of the platform. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absconding by the owner. So the the platform owner just uh, you know uh, you know get your money and then just run away. Okay. So a Ponzi scheme or fabricated information about borrow. So uh, in China, okay, there's a, as I said, the important feature of this market is this uh, almost all platform offer principal guarantee terms. So what, what does it mean? It means that number one, platform forms their own reserve fund. So it's just like similar to bank reserve. You know how bank work. You get lender giving the money, you deposit the money and then you lend the money out, right? So the platform also get its reserve fund. And then by pulling money from lenders, and then they can, in some sense, a hedge borrower's default risk, just like the bank, it says a reserve fund, and then uh, uh, and then you have a, a reserve rate, right? And then it says that, okay, this is money I did keep, and then I invest the rest of the money to uh, borrow to other people. So lender, on, in some sense, they're exposed to less risk of borrower default under the principal guarantee term. So it's not like, okay, there were, there were this up, uh, uh, borrower one, two, three. If lender one just land via the platform to borrow one, if borrow one default, lender one cannot get the money now uh, in the information input intermediary uh, business model. However, under this principal guarantee term, if borrow one fell, lender one can still get the money back. Okay? So it's hedging the risk uh, you know, for borrower default. Just like in the bank, if the bank invests in some project and then the project fail, it's not going to affect your deposit rate. But on the other hand, these are not banks. Number one, they are under much less, uh, you know, regulation. Number two is they are reserve fund and they don't have like a, a good risk management. They don't keep enough reserve fund. They uh, and they also they have a low registered capital, so that they the lender actually face the possibility of platform collapse. So, uh, what kind of problem? Okay, uh, you know what kind of there were many study okay before to study like what kind of platform is less likely to help to fail. Uh, that's very intuitive. Like platform with more registered capital, and uh, sometimes it's backed by state-owned enterprise or by venture capital is less likely to fail. But these studies are all using the you know 2017 or 2016 data. They study what kind of platform fails. Okay, then lender cannot give the money back. The problem is this thing. November 2020, this market already, you know, and all platform decided to quit. So uh, what had happened? Um, here is a summary of the entire history. So large number of platform, you know, compete by offering, you know, products with high return and the principal guarantee, which is, uh, you can see it's a formatic exposed entire industry to a very high risk. And since 2015, uh, you know, because of the large entry, uh, fraud and scandal cases like Fania and Yinzu are frequently happen. The number of lender and trading volume continue to decline after 2017. But the industry although already have a lot of platforms there. So lacking new investment, the reserve fund gets easily depleted and the platform fail to fulfill their principal guarantee commitment. At the beginning, people, you know, many people believe this when they see the advertisement. They didn't realize that the platform would fail. They just thought, oh, that's good. Okay, so if the borrower fail, it doesn't affect me. But actually, the platform will fail. And then because the start, platform starts to fail, they know that this principal guarantee, uh, you know, commitment is actually, you know, uh, it's actually something fake. Okay, it's not, not something you can trust. And then people go, oh, this is actually fake. It's not a real thing that platform can keep up with. Then the lending base continues to shrink as the investor lost confidence to the safety of P2P platform. Then 2018, the largest wave of platform collapse. And then in 2019, uh, we have some leading platform. This is called Tuan Dai, the other is Hong Yi Zi, but okay. So these are, uh, and then also uh, they, they collapse. These are very influential cases that you could follow the news. And then there were two leading, also two other leading platforms. One is uh, leading by Pinan Bank, and then the other is this uh, New York Stock Exchange. Uh, the first platform, PP Dai, okay, so they, they all withdraw from the business, and then the number of people who platform return to zero in 2007. Okay. So that's what's happening in the history, and uh, uh, we have a model for that. And then there were several important elements which sort of capture what happened and provide some policy information. So uh, 
here as I uh, you know teach you reading uh, lecture there was some uh, exogenous verbal and there's some endogenous verbal okay so uh so there was a there was some lender and or investor okay and then with a certain mass okay and then each one of these lender investors have one unit of cash and decide whether to invest the mass of lender okay will either invest in I call it zero platform or one platform that this uh, haven't defined okay so zero platform is this information intermediate platform and one platform means those which is uh, uh you know uh, offer this principal guarantee term that's it have a form its own reserve bed and then it has some risk but it's going to have this uh difficult uh, have this a uh, danger of failing itself so uh, we will have a little, at the beginning, all the investors are rational, and then in the extension, we have a proportion of uh, lambda, naive investor, who believe the principal guarantee term always hope when they make the decision. So the rational investor will expect, you need to know, okay, this principal guarantee term is actually not going to fulfill all every time, it may fail, but we have naive investor who believe it, okay? So, which is true, okay, we do have lots of uh, investor that uh, believe them when they put the money to the PPP platform, they believe that's safe. Uh, borrowers, they will need the outside finance of one dollar, each one of them. And then uh, if the project succeed, then they will return uh, a some money R with some return. And then their success rate, some are high, some are low. Okay. Uh, then we have an important exogenous variable that is a total number of time. Very important, this little n here. So each one that we choose whether to offer principal guarantee. So if they offer their one platform, if they don't offer, they call it zero platform. So the equilibrium number of zero platform and one platform is like a, a this is the endogenous variable N0, M1, all right? And then, you know, we have one other uh, exogenous variable, we call it the regulatory capacity. So what is this regulatory capacity? So uh, in, we introduce it because we want to fit the data. In the data, we find there were fortunate cases, right? Some platform just record up score with the money. So uh, if you know about the regulation in 2016, there is a regulation about you have to put the money in the custody account, not on your own account, okay? So whenever you appeal to the platform, you find the money, you put in in the custody account in the traditional bank. So you cannot just uh, take the money and uh, go away, right? However, we see, although there is this regulation in 2016, but you still see cases after cases of that. The reason is there is limited you know, capacity in regulating. Uh, there were several departments in response for that, and then they turned out they didn't, they wasn't able to monitor everyone. So this, we call it L, that's the uh, regulatory capacity. And this is, means that, you know, it's a, you can monitor a limited number of platforms. And then if, you know, some platform, so if the platform want to run away with the money or commit financial fraud, it has to have money on its account. So you, if you are information intermediary, if you are information intermediary, uh, you cannot run away with the money because the money is matched one-to-one -to, -one to the borrower. It's only when you set up your own reserve fund, then you have this uh, possibility to do so. So uh, among these uh, M1 platform, which are the platform that offer principal guarantee and you know, pull all your money together, these platform, uh, so they will repay if they are solvent and if they're under regulation, under monitoring. Otherwise, they will come involved. Okay, so there is this uh, another factor. We try to capture, we try to match the data so that there are some platform who come in from, some have platform who don't. So, so what a zero platform is a pure information intermediary platform. So they will charge a, a commission fee to match the borrower to an investor. So you, I want to borrow 100 through the platform, I pay platform $2 in order to borrow the money and the platform make profit in this way. So if the project success, investor will receive R. This is like a market interest rate that I show you in the window index. It, it's somewhere uh, you know, uh, between them. So it's a market interest rate. The borrower is going to receive the rest. Okay, so R minus R, okay. So, but uh, if the project fails, then of course, both of them receive zero. So in this case, the platform does not bear any risk because it's simply an information intermediary, okay? So whenever some uh, you know, borrower fails or, or, or what, then the platform itself does not you know, bear any risk. Sometimes they find the borrower is not attractive, they, they fail to get finance. Some borrower are attractive, they, they get finance. So this is how this uh, uh, 
peer-to-peer -peer lending platform works in the US and UK. Sometimes it's crowdfunding. We have several, we have an objective of, I need to finance this many dollars, and then they invite the lender to just, uh, uh, you know, uh, invest up to that amount. So this is the uh, one platform. Okay, uh, zero platform. This is type of this one platform, sorry. So this one platform, okay, is a, uh, uh, they offer principal guarantee. We can even call it a shadow bank. Shadow bank just means that it's uh, performing the function of a bank, but it's outside of the you know, formal banking sector. So these shadow banks or platform with principal guarantee, they collect money from lenders and invest it to borrower, and then but it's from its own uh, it's a fund. So the platform, of course, will also be paid out to each investor whenever it's solvent according to the principal guarantee terms. And the platform here share the risk with borrower investor, right? Because he may deplete this fund and bankrupt if many of the borrower fail. I, on the other hand, if they are not being monitored, uh, because money is on their account, so they have the risk of uh, upscore with the money, money away with them. So uh, then I'm going to characterize several forces in this model and uh, generate the result. Number one is, as a borrower, when will I you know, get financed? So the borrower have an expected return. That's, uh, this is what I get if the project is successful. And then this is the, uh, uh, this is the mass of lender that we're going to uh, you know, uh, kind of lend me the money, which is, can be also think about a probability I get by this. Okay. So on the platform, the X can be zero and one. On both platforms, it's the same case because they are all lending, borrowing money through the platform, paying the commission fee F, and then they have some probability being financed, not always. And then they have some probability to success. And then if I make this uh, expected return greater equal to zero, then there is this uh, effect we call it positive selection. That means that your success rate need to be at least as high as some level in order to get finance. If you project look bad, okay, then you don't get finance. This MX here, which is the mass of investor on the platform, play this role. That is, if M is large, so you have more borrower, then this will decrease, right? It means that, uh, you know, this will decrease that more, uh, you know, kind of like more borrower can get, can get finance. So the more, so if the business expand, they can finance those projects with higher risk or lower success rate. But this is also very intuitive. Uh, but there is this uh, positive selection that data will indicate, right? So when this positive selection means that when there's competition across platforms, then each platform will have less resources. They can finance less projects so that they will select better projects to finance. So on, in some sense, competition is good in this because you know, you, uh, when you have less money on hand and you are more careful in your investment, you only invest on the top project. When you have more money, you need to invest out, then you start investing more inferior projects. The zero platform, okay, they, they are, uh, profit is very simple. So fee times uh, you know, num number of investors, okay? So there are this many investors, they can finance this many projects and then they collect this many fee. So the zero platforms, pure information in the intermediate platform has a very simple, uh, but they just want to have more uh, investor. But on the other hand, uh, the one platform, those are who offer principal guarantee, their profit function is more complicated. So this is how many investors will uh, choose their platform to invest. And then in this term, it means that basically, it, uh, it's not being monitored. So the regulator is abstain and the platform just has to with the money. So this is the incentive of committing financial fraud. Among the, from the rational player's perspective, okay, if I'm a rational investor, I will know this is the possibility. If I give money, I mean, so if on the street, somebody says that, please give me your money, I'm going to invest. You were not going to give it because if you give him, then he will go to run away with the money, right? Similar to the platform that if you give the money that without any monitoring, then the regulation is going to run away with the money. On the other hand, there are some chance you can get the money back. That is number one, it's under, uh, it's make, it's under regulation. So it will make real investment. Uh, this real investment will give returns. And then there's this uh, selection effect that only uh, project with 
in sufficiently large success rate will get investment. So this, there are two terms. One is a running away with learning. The other is a real investment. And then from the new lender platform do the selection of projects. So, uh, and then of course you get repaid. This is negative part, okay? And then, so this is repay under principal guarantee term. The platform will always repay no matter whether the project success or not. So here, the, uh, so in the, uh, in the zero platform, this is a platform as an information intermediary. Okay, he does not bear the risk. So he also does not repay. Repay is directly from the borrower. But here, the repay is by the platform. Okay? Here, the repay is also taking away from the platform's money directly to the investor. Okay, so uh, here is uh, what the equilibrium look like. So number one, the equilibrium consists of this element. That is the invest investor distribution, the lender distribution, and then also the business model choice. So the blue is the... Uh, Indulgence variable, okay, that's uh, from this model. And then this, uh, in the baseline model, that is N and R, number of platform and then limited regulatory capacity affecting this equilibrium. So here is uh, what the equilibrium looks like. Basically, it's a bound bound equilibrium. Uh, we can make it smooth by introducing a uh, type of the platform. We don't, we don't need that to explain the phenomenon. So this is the uh, uh, Nash equilibrium. So basically, it, very simple, the idea is, when the competition is, uh, is, is less, then people choose uh, to be information intermediary. That's what happened in developed countries, UK and USA. And then in, when the competition became large to a certain point, then all the platform will switch to offer principal guarantee. Why? Intense competition tips the platforms from being pure information intermediary to shadow bank. Why this is the case? Number one, we know, as we said, the large, so this is, this is the force that make it um, make happen. That's a, a large number of platform makes monitoring difficult. So every in every country, the regulatory capacity is limited. Okay, when you have more and more platform doing this business in all sorts of provinces, and then the government haven't you know the, this in, this industry grows so fast, the government even don't have the uh, uh, resources to catch up with this uh, huge regulatory need. Then it costs you know uh, you know the chance to. Uh, run away with the money, okay, because you have to hold your own with the fund. So for to have this uh, chance to do the financial fund. But on the other hand, uh, a larger number of platform will uh, cause a smaller mass of investor of each platform. Then you have a stronger positive selection in this uh, uh, shadow banks. So under intense competition, each platform has less money, so they invest more carefully, they invest to the best quality project. So there's pros and cons, there are two forces. So this, so uh, it's a very, you know, this, uh, this, this solution is bound bound. So we just had uh, two cases when you intense, it typically them from pure information to way to shadow back. But this happens exactly, you know, it fits the reality, uh, you know, well. So number one is when uh, in the developed world and also before 2012, there are only a few platforms, they by that time all use the information they themselves, they don't set up reserve bound, they don't pick up the risk. It is, and then in the no regulation period, uh, people find that the uh, cross-platform competition, okay, start to make platform begin to adopt the practice of principal guarantee. And then in 2015, 2017, almost all the platform already uh, start to have this uh, principal, principal guarantee. So, uh, but we, we, by that time, okay, so if you open up these uh, uh, P2P platforms website, they all claim that some of this website can still be open today. So they all claim that you know, their the investments say you are going to get your return back for sure. You're not exposed to any risk. So uh, here is a, a figure showing the uh, number one, the effect of competition. Number one, number two is how was the real welfare implication. So basically, the, uh, this is the uh, uh, tipping point. After that, platform will change business model. So number one is competition among information intermediary platform are will benefit to the investor. The reason is, as I said, uh, you know, platform you know want to offer better service, provide better quality project with less failure rate, so it's increasing. But up, after that, the more platform uh, there, then given the limited uh, you know, regulated capacity, more fortunate cases will happen, so the investor welfare starts to decrease. Okay. And then there were two cases you can see here, the starting point is 
once you go below that, it's already dropped. And on the right on, on and on the right hand side panel, when it's go below, it can still up for a while and then start to drop. So on the left hand side, this is an information intermediary platform. On the right hand side, it means that the market goes to a certain state, people start to compete. They basically in response to a more intense competition, people start to respond to offer principal guarantee terms as that I'm going to claim that I'm going to return your uh, investment safely. Uh, and then you hedge the risk with the lender. At the beginning, it's attractive. Lender find is a good deal. And then so uh, it starts higher. So what's the difference between this and this one? Is the, uh, the right-hand side have a, a sufficiently large L, limited at uh, the uh, regulatory capacity. So if the regulatory capacity is sufficiently large, it's possible that the shadow bank business model can improve welfare because it hedged the risk for the uh, lenders. So it's not like lender, you need to select project yourself and then sometimes you select a bad project, you, uh, you, you lost the money. So if the regulation is enough, it's possible that you can uh, you know, get benefit from this principal guarantee term that these are the just uh, like banks get collecting your money, invest and then safely return your money. But you need the regulatory capacity to be something really large. So, uh, and then we have one more thing to introduce. That's called the uh, naive investor. What is the naive? It actually play a very important role in China. So a proportion of Lambda naive investor, they hold a misperception. This is not rational uh, investor anymore. Right? Rational investors should be able to expect that if I see a principal guarantee term that says that, you know, in the advertisement, says that I'm surely going to return your money to you, then as a rational investor, you should expect this, he may not always hire, High risk or high return always means uh, you know it implies high risk. So you expect this going to happen, right? So as a rational investor, you know after you know, you know have some uh, training with some knowledge, this is a rational investor should expect. But turns out this is not the case. Uh, you know in reality there are lots of empirical papers says that people have limited we call it financial literacy. That the naive investor will hold a misperception that the platforms offering principal guarantee always repay the money, always repay the money. They believe this is true, okay? So uh, when lots of Chinese investors, they put money in different kinds of finance product, and then there were advertisement about that, there's proportion of money, uh, proportion of people believe that. In the literature, there are uh, many papers showing different aspects, we call it financial literacy, or this uh, fund rational uh, investor problem. So investor may be uh, unaware of some hidden fee. So when you open the bank account, you don't read every term, so you uh, don't see some hidden fee there. Or there was some hidden contract term you didn't uh, pay attention to. And sometimes uh, there are aware of some options. Some aware of firm have some information advantage. And then uh, we actually, this paper is written by me and the Mike offer earlier, that's about uh, you know, people are no possible. Uh, you know, people are unaware of the possibility of financial fraud. Right? So they sometimes invest in it. This is the, actually the example by the time we use. This is the, the fund yard advertisement. Uh, sorry, this is in uh, Chinese. So uh, it claim a very high um, interest re uh, return rate, thirteen percent, and then it, it claims something like. Uh, oh, sorry, it doesn't show that. So it's under government uh, regulation, which is not, and then. Uh, a super high return, very flexible, and then extremely safe. So basically, uh, it claimed this, okay? And then by the time there's really not much regulations restricting firm from playing this kind of financial product, and the people believe that. So that caused problem. So this naive investor will affect the equilibrium we just described earlier, because the naive investor have a problem. They will not invest in platform without principal guarantee. Why? Because if they, you know, the information intermediary is a platform like this, they say that if you invest, your risk is on your own. And then what is the average success rate? They are all doing on this business. As a naive investor, okay, they will say that the other platform is claiming that I'm, I'm going to bear the risk for you. So I guarantee to pay the money back to you. So if you are a naive investor, oh, this is a much better term because you have a misperception that the platform will you know, hold the will keep their promise. So in this case, in this zero platform, uh, as they share the risk with, with vendor, but one platform, this uh, with principal guarantee, they 
have the risk of collapse and fraud, but they they claim that you know the borrower, if they fail, I still pay you the money back, right? So the people who are hold the misperception will are unaware of this kind of risk. They only aware of risk that some, you know, this uh, small borrower they may default. But this platform, uh, I trust it. Then what happened is this uh, threshold n will start will decrease. Threshold n means that in this picture, it's going to decrease. So the equilibrium is still like that when the competition goes to a certain level, people start to offer principal guarantee. But it is e it, the, re the, the reason that uh, it, it, the threshold n decreases is because uh, the you know the existence of naive investor make offering principal guarantee more attractive because these people believe me. Okay, so it's more attractive, right? So it's more you are more inclined. There are less rational investor. If it's rational investor, then I offer principal guarantee, they don't trust me, it's less attractive, right? But now I have a group of people that trust this kind of claim, so that it's uh, more attractive, right? And then uh, in, there are some ambiguous welfare implications. The reason is, as long as regulatory capacity is enough, it's possible, as we said, that offering principal guarantee can, you know, uh, can, you know, improve the welfare, but it's only under sufficiently large uh, regulatory capacity, as this two figure says, if you want this kind of thing happen at, at this range, you need L to be sufficiently large. So, and there is also a very interesting phenomenon, which is the no, you know, as a story, okay, we, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I teach you in, the, in this seminar, that's uh, good enough, but for academic paper, okay, we, we have something noble to the literature, okay, that's uh, this very last point. It's very intuitive. It says that information disclosure about possible failure of principal guarantee may not happen. Okay, so what does this mean? So what does information disclosure mean? It means trying to educate the investor, and then you know to reduce the proportion of uh, IV investor. Okay, so this is good, right? So in in if you now you open WeChat and then you want to invest in the uh, in the WeChat Pay, there was some investment option. Before you do that you have to go through a test. So basically evaluate how risk, what is the risk bearing behavior? Do you have some basic knowledge of finance? Once you go through that, then you can invest. So what's the purpose of that? It's trying to give you some basic education, evaluate whether you understand investment or not. So these are financial education, they try to disclose information that these things are risky. Right? Uh, in many cases, this is a good practice as a policymaker, it's a good practice, but in this case, okay, in this case, uh, it may not improve welfare. Do uh, uh, I have another? I think it's here. I, I should write out here. Let me see. Many ways. Sorry, let me see. Uh, oh, I think I should add one more point here. So there's this force here. So, uh, as a, so think about in, in this room, there are many, uh, you know, there's a platforms that claiming they are safe. And then if one of the platform, if one of the platforms start to disclose information about, you know, they are, they are, you know, actually exposed, there are some possibility I'm going to have. This is honest, right? So there are many people here, or are or many platforms all saying that uh, I'm completely safe. And then one of the platforms be, start to be honest and says that, uh, you know, I actually have some risk. I may collapse. Okay, then this is not going to teach investor that. Uh, okay, well, this is on this platform. We should trust it more. <laughs> it's instead, it says that oh, this platform is risky. It's not like the other. It's probably because he is risky, so that you know I'm going to invest platform, uh, invest money on other platform who does not disclose any information. So in this market, disclosing information from a platform perspective may hurt this platform. So being honest hurt himself. And then on the other hand, when the number of uh, on one, when the number of uh, uh, platform who doing, uh, you know this uh, uh, shadow bank business, uh, when the number of investors start to decrease, that's what we said after 2015, uh, 16 start to decrease to plat one platform more likely. Yeah. Okay, so these two forces together make information disclosure uh, not effective policy to to help this market. So. But uh, what happened in policy, okay? Let's also review that. So 
policy innovation practice uh, doing this during 2016, uh, the they call the uh, like what is the uh Ying Bao Jianju. Okay, so the, there's a there's a regulatory uh, the regulatory body for that. They uh, start to notice this problem in this B2B market, and then they launch a very detailed uh, you know, regulation concerning this market. So it prohibits the platform from uh, certain activity, including fundraising for platform themselves. Okay, okay, and then so which means you know, platform just says that it's not about investing other borrowers. Just please give me money to me. Uh, securitization. And you see here, prohib providing guarantee to invest on repaying principal and returning on returns on investment. So even in 2016, this kind of business model is already being banned. But if you see the, the website of those platforms up at the time, okay, they still claim this. So uh, it's because the law is so once this thing you know became regulated, became a law, then it still requires the regulator body to build up a uh, you know a system to enforce this law. So unfortunately, things happen too fast so that uh, it doesn't uh, catch up. So platform still doing this thing that being prohibited. And then 2016, the platform were required to establish custody account also. They find out that, oh, there's lots of cases. The platform simply run away with the money. So you cannot keep your money in your own account. You have to have custody account in the bank. And then uh, you know, perform transaction through the banks, not just uh, by yourself from uh, some FinTech technology you can do the online transaction. And in 2017, it's about information disclosure. It required platform to make truthful, adequate, and complete and timely information disclosure to the public. And in all disclosure, uh, must, information must be verified by third party like accounting firm or, or firms. So uh, here are some comments made by me. So before 2015, no regulation, right? And in 2016, there's nearly already thousands of platforms. The regular capacity by the time is too weak. And then, it's also since then there were many high profile cases of platform class. The Fan Ya case and then the Yuzuba case all happened in 2015. So by that time, the lender base already started to shrink. Okay. So when as the lender base shrinks, uh, you know, what what, what th then you know this platform uh, using a shadow bank model have reserve, have this uh, reserve account. Uh, later we have this information disclosure policy and increasing investor sophistication. It causes more platform to be less profitable because they used to be able to deceive the uh, investor. Now they are less capable of doing that. And then people are aware of their work, you know, possibly a classic fraud. So more platform collapse and in the end, it's already uh, too late to save this market. So uh, other policy implications. So in P2P market, uh, competition have ambiguous welfare effect. So it's not like in if you remember what's taught in class, the Kuna market competition is good, right? I mean, many market competition is good, but in this market, competition has ambiguous welfare. And the main thing is come from the regu uh, limited regulatory capacity. So uh, regulators, so if the regulators do not have a large regulatory capacity, the right thing to do is establish high barrier to entry. It's not at the beginning, you can have a, you are, as a consulting firm or tech firm, you can register and start to do finance. Okay, actually, finance is the industry that require, uh, you know, regulation. It's not everybody can just start open, uh, open up their store and then do the finance. So this is one thing that uh, by 2015 and or maybe even early 2012 that the government should be more aware of. They shouldn't just uh, think this is a chance to increase finance uh, in finance inclusion, but this is actually market require a certain regulatory capacity. So strictly enforcing the regulation on a small number of platforms may, you know, like setting up custody account and prohibit some business model may, you know, uh, save this market. Then the, the market go in different trajectory. Uh, if you look at, you know, uh, this, uh, uh, this this comparison again, uh, this comparison again. I, I don't have the data, unfortunately, 2019 and 20. I will try to update it later. So these you can see that. Uh, uh, China market grows so fast at this period of time, while other markets are still growing, but in the, uh, you know, they, they kind of reach certain steady state. There's just this many, you know, demand for people to be planned. But China, you know, kind of uh, experienced this boom and bust because of this uh, uh, missing regulatory capacity and a low entry barrier. And, uh, and also, there's uh, also very important uh, insight that is general almost to all the market that is the level of regulation should depend on level of financial literacy or the level of uh, sophistication of the consumer 
So in China, majority investor were individuals who are much less sophisticated than institutional investor. Actually, in UK and US, uh, even the P2P market, the uh, institutional investors are more prominent. Okay, seventy percent are from institutional investors. This is not the case in China. Mostly are uh, individuals. And also in China, many investors ignore the high people risk of borrower and are aware of the uh, risk of platform collapse and other deceptive actions, such as running away with the money. Uh, in, uh, if, if you see how the UK regulatory authority says, they says that they need to ensure that the retail investor are fully aware that lending on P2P platform is not like bank deposit. Okay? And then uh, this is the uh, good process practice. So, of course, other things are universal credit scoring system. And then uh, when there's a new business model based on fintech, at the beginning, you should pay due diligence. If you remember, in 2020, there's also a case about this Yuan uh, okay, the Bank of China crude oil investment product. And uh, this is also a new business model by the time. And then uh, the regular authority just let it go. And then uh, people, when they invest, they, you know, they are expecting certain return. They never think about the price of the crude can drop to negative, right? negative 38 by the time, 38 US dollars. So the, the crude, crude oil can drop to a price of negative. Nobody is aware of that. So with this a new business model, it's a, a sometimes the regulation need to be more careful. Uh, so uh, lastly, just uh, what, what the police department says that all financial products have the same feature, high return, okay? okay so. Uh, <laughs> okay, this is the end of the talk. So uh, thank you, you can ask me. Some uh, thank you so much, uh, Sunny. That was that was really very really interesting. Uh, can I just ask us some technical questions before I open it up to the floor? Uh, uh, the first is: Is your model a single equilibrium model or a multiple equilibrium model? Yeah. So uh, it's uh, it's normal that in this. When you have many endogenous variables, the model will have uh, multiple equilibrium. Mm -hmm. So there was some we call it equilibrium selection, the which you think is plausible. So it's a very simple tool we call it a uh, profit dominant. So uh, it, it's profit dominant equilibrium means that there are many equilibrium, okay? But uh, the these firms will collectively select the one that their profit are uh, maximized. Uh, this may not be always true in the reality, just a one way to select. Okay. Uh, on a more substantive note, um, it's actually very fascinating the model because uh, I mean we're all familiar with adverse selection, right? where bad customers or bad yeah, risks right. are chosen. Uh, and, and we also know the traditional adverse yeah. selection theory right. is that it may decimate the market. Yeah. Uh, no market exists. Mm -hmm. So yours is similar, except it is not adverse right, selection right, right. of customers, it's adverse selection oh. of uh, business models, right? Yeah. In this case, That's principal right. guarantee terms, right. Right. Uh, uh, shadow banks. Yeah. Right? So those are the two aspects of adverse selection. Uh, what, what name would you give this, uh, if not adverse selection? Uh, uh, the, the answer is very simple. So uh, because, so number one is that, you, you see I have this a positive selection. Right? So this is exactly opposite to negative uh, adverse selection. Mm -hmm. So here, the reason we have Positive selection instead of adverse selection is because we don't have asymmetric information on the success rate. If the bank, if the uh, platform cannot see uh, the borrower's uh, success probability, so if uh, you know as a platform, I have no way to know who is more risky, who is less risky. Then in this case, we call it asymmetric information. Then you have the problem of adverse selection. But here it's a, a complete information model, so. As a platform, I can see who, who is more safe, who is less safe. Hmm. Uh, and then the reason we adopt this setting is very simple. The, the reason is we want competition to have some benefit. That's right. uh, otherwise, if we have ever selection, we don't have that. So the, it's just a, a, a way that we select to build a model to fit the reality. Hmm. We want competition to still have some benefit. Of course, competition also have other problems, but yeah. we want competition to have some benefit. Thank you. Uh, yeah. While you're thinking of a question, maybe I'll ask uh, uh, a third one, which is that there's a risk that people may draw the wrong lessons yeah. in China from the disappearance of the P2P market. Oh, they say this is a bad business model, it is unethical, it is uh, inefficient. Right. But actually, as your initial chart showed, there are potentially huge 
efficiency gains right, right, right. had from yeah. having a, That's right. a, a viable That's right. yeah. a P2P model, right? Because yeah. the spread is huge, right? It's about yeah, 1, yeah, 1, yeah. 1, 1,500 basis points. Right, right, right. Uh, and it so happens that the way the market developed, lack of regulatory capacity, too large yeah, yeah. The market size, as well as this race to the bottom in terms of you know these shadow banks right, right, right. providing it's, a principal guarantee loan. So if you were to advise a regulator, what would you say to him to say, don't draw the wrong lessons? Because it is, it is a useful innovation. Right, right. Uh, what, what, what would be the policy advice or recommendation you would give to the regulator? Because there's a real, as I said, right, there's a real right. risk they draw the wrong lessons. Yeah, all of this. yeah I think the, the word, it's, a, it's the one that I listed at the end. It's about, yeah, at the beginning, you should set high entry barrier. So not at the beginning, very low entry barrier, just let, you know, wherever the market grow we sell. It's a finance market. It's very different from, uh, you know, a usual product market that you can, the more competition is better. It's a finance market. And then it also depends on the investor's confidence. Okay, so uh, as a finance market, then uh, when you're releasing the market, you'll be much more careful. So don't let it just grow like that as a, at the beginning and then swing to the other right, 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 right. that's right yeah, yeah. Exactly. Don't, don't go from regulatory extreme to regulatory extreme. we have another question on uh from the q a box uh, following the bus after 2020 mm -hmm. where are the borrowers right these informal yeah. borrowers getting their loans i presume from other informal means and where are the investors putting their money as another form of unregulated underground shadow banking power. yeah so uh one is very so. First, let me tell you uh, about uh, where the borrow, where the lenders start to put their money in. Uh, it's uh, very unfortunate they start to put money in more like corporate bonds. For example, Hong Da Li Cai. Okay, so corporate bonds. Okay, so uh, these are not like peer to peer like small business right? but it's not formal. This is like they're, they're, no, uh, it's a you know firm using its own credibility to borrow money directly from the. Investor, mm -hmm. right? Usually they can ask for more. Or the other example is a high high hung is high, right? So so they they have need for money and then they they can ask for a higher rate, ten percent or something like that, and then it attract lots of these investors. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's very unfortunate. You know, so one 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 so that's why yeah. So that's why uh, you know. <clears throat> <it's> more <laughs> financial fraud. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any questions from the audience here? I think it's fascinating. I mean, it, it's a, uh, you know, we, we have this idea that FinTech potentially is, you know, can promote financial inclusion. And I think it, it can, right? It can yep. across the board. And yet the way the market developed somehow, right, right led to a very yep. unfortunate and yep. ultimately- I, Second part market. of the question, by, by the way, about uh, where does the uh, borrower get money now? Uh, I, I actually don't know. So for the small and medium sized firm, yeah, like what is the other option? Uh, I actually, I'm not yeah. quite sure, yeah. yeah. And so, and so, and so, when you don't have something like that, mm. legitimate small businesses that do not have a good right, right, right. existing credit, yeah. they, they are financially excluded. That's right. right. So, so presumably the new fintech developments, right? Mm. The micro credit yeah. by Ali, by by Tower right, right. That's by, a by that's a good, good model. Yeah, the Ali Pay to finance is a good model. We we consider it as a very successful. That and even that seems to be in, coming under regulatory crackdown too. Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> right. That's right. Yeah. 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 Any any immediate questions or thoughts or comments? Yeah, go ahead. So I was told. Yeah. Well, I don't say I need that. Yeah. It's okay. People online can hear that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for the seminar. Uh, I I was told that there's nowadays no P two P platforms in China, but um, you know even after a mass extinction, there will be one or two species that survived. Mm -hmm. But why now there's no P2P forms in China? Oh, it's because the central bank, but basically the regulatory body you have to give up the entire market. So what's uh, being announced here in November 2020? Uh, I am from the School of Science, so I okay. not. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't state that. I just said I, I stay as a result, but it's actually not a, uh, it's not a result. It's actually by two, in November 2020, 20, uh, actually the uh, in Baojianhui, okay, so the, the regulatory body actually says that, you know, basically they uh, start in 2020, uh, 2020, they start to just uh, kind of like, they themselves, they start to close down this market. They don't allow this business to survive anymore. So 
So it's not a natural market. It's right? not. It's when the, the you know regulator. the start market starts to collapse. At some point, the regulator just decided to close down this market. So this is an announcement by the. Uh, you know, there's a clear point that this is uh, when this market stopped. It's because there's the this regu the regulatory bodies decided to close down this market. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, but this relates to the earlier question. Some some other form of unregulated shadow banking will emerge. Uh, yeah. Just like a species doesn't go away. Yeah. yeah. Any other final questions? Um, yeah, one more. Uh, how do they enforce the crackdown in, uh, in 2020? How did they shut it down? Um, I'm not sure. Okay, but <laughs> yeah, the 2020. Uh, I can I can later put in a in a in a in a. Uh, in a news link about that, so there is a this uh, event that it turned out that says that no, this this is yeah. I, I guess it may be too soon, but uh, uh, but too soon to see how 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 they did it and whether they actually succeeded uh, in, in establishing in, in uh, eliminating this market, this market. Uh, okay, if if I, I realize it's past five, okay, go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you for the uh, maybe the last question. And thank you for the talk, first of all. And I want to ask a question kind of related to this phenomenon of illegal fundraising. I kind of sense it's like the DNA, like in the mainland finance market. So for example, maybe at the end of last century, like the commercial banking also do kind of like yeah. the illegal fundraising right. and lead to a lot of frauds. Yeah. And after the P2P, there are also like some kind of the uh, uh, the, the institute, <laughs> the institute, like they promised the elderly, they oh, would, right, right, right. They would pr provide the like the residential place for them right. at, and ask them to invest uh, at, or deposit the money yeah. in the institute. So I kind of like just sense like why this illegal fundraising is always happening. Like, I think uh, it's uh, mainly being explained by this figure. That's uh, um, there is need for the, you know, the basically the, the formal bank is not uh, providing okay. enough so there are people who will to borrow at a higher rate so there are people who will borrow at a higher rate and then uh, uh they cannot get in the traditional bank so then and then there are also investors who are willing to of course want to get a higher return than five percent in the bank so there's demand there's supply and then you know uh, the, the market just grow in different forms yeah, just emerge in different forms. So a uh, further question is that uh, what would you suggest if we want to like systematically like deal with this uh, oh, continuous illegal fundraising? So, so for example, like, uh, like the barriers, right, two, barriers. right, two yes. things. First is about the uh, credit system. Credit system, China is improving a lot. So uh, about your credit system. So uh, that's one thing that's uh, going on the right direction. Uh, and then, uh, of course, somehow we call about financial literacy. People get more and more sophisticated. Uh, they know they know how to purchase product on Taobao, and then they know how to purchase a product in the supermarket. And then later, people get more sophisticated. They know how to purchase product in finance market. Right? So then, uh, they, that, that will get better. And then there's a, one other thing is about the uh, capital restriction. Of course, this thing we don't expect is going to change in the near future. That uh, individual Chinese investor is you cannot invest in directly in a foreign asset, right? So if there is a much more option for investment, in investing in foreign different kind, for example, you can invest in ETF found in the US stock market, then, uh, then maybe many of investors would choose to do that instead of uh, uh, investing in uh, Hang Dao, it's high, right? So then, uh, but this, I think the last one won't happen in the new, in the, in the, in the expectable future. But the first two is still, uh, it's still it's, it's the going in the right direction that people have a credit system and people can get more and more sophisticated. They have been, you know, taught these lessons and then be more so sophisticated in, uh, in their investment behavior. Yeah. 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 Well, thank, thanks very much for all the questions. Uh, I think it's past five. Uh, just leads me to thank uh, Professor Sunny Hong for very informative, very insightful, and very interesting. Uh, seminar. So thanks very much and please join me everyone.